I'm going to use the cruddy microphone on the back of this camera. I really think I need to do something about that. Anyway, right, okay, welcome to another big science. Uh, I'm going to stop doing chemistry because the people who were uh, interested in chemistry have now done their exams. So I'm going to start talking about biology, but if you've got any requests about chemistry, I'm happy to add those. Uh, what I'm specifically going to talk about today is the phyla. Now, classification of living things works as follows. There are enormous things called kingdoms, which include like the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, the fungus kingdom, and so forth. And then below that, there are obviously sub-kingdoms, but below that again, there are phyla. Now, as far as animals are concerned, phyla are the basic body plans of animals, the various different ways in which they um, organise their bodies. And... There are, I think, something like seven major phyla. Now, I've excluded Protestants from this because Protestants are not really animals in the sense that an, a Protestant can be an animal in the dark and a plant in the light because in the light it will develop chloroplasts and start photosynthesizing, but in the dark it will start eating things. So I'm going to exclude those and talk about, first of all, a, a number that you're not going to find around here, the first of which is sponges. Now, sponges are not these things obviously but obviously you can get natural sponges they live in the sea although there are also freshwater versions now this obviously is a sponge it does actually resemble the living sponge to some extent because that's where the idea comes from so it will be able to filter feed in a sense because you can go like that soak up stuff and that's how they feed they're a collection of cells uh, which have hairs on them and they beat the water through feed on the water they don't have organs or tissues or anything like that interestingly they do have internal skeletons and that's interesting also because animals with internal skeletons tend to have hard internal skeletons in order to preserve themselves in a particular position and prevent themselves from moving whereas we for some strange reason have hard external skeletons that help us to move so that's the first lot the next lot is the snidaria or cnidaria which are nettle animals. Those are things like jellyfish, sea anemones, Portuguese man of war, all of that sort of stuff. And they have bodies that are basically a sheet of two cells, which are sort of perhaps sort of a bit crenellated or something. So, you know, they're flower-like animals, for example, or the jellyfish that are going like that. And they don't really have internal organs again, but they do have tissues. They do have some organs. For example, they have balance organs and they have um, tentacles hanging down or going up for example um, they've been around for a very long time and they're also radially symmetrical that is they have the kind of symmetry that circular objects have rather than the kind of symmetry that say a bus has or something so which is bilateral symmetry so they're unusual in that respect uh, and they also have stinging cells which are cells that spring out and sting things so that they can eat their prey next one along uh, the flatworms now the flatworms are slightly more sophisticated. They have three layers to their body, unlike the cnidaria, which have two layers. Those three layers are um, have a, a gut going through the middle. They have a digestive system. They have eyes. They have ears, uh, and so forth. Uh, but they don't have an internal body cavity, with the result that they can't make waves that pull food along inside them, and so forth. And they don't have blood, so they have to be flat so that they can absorb and give up oxygen easily. And their digestive system also acts as a kind of blood system by transporting digestive food around and that. So those are the next lot. And um, an example of that would be a planarian, but those are not particularly well known. There are a lot of other ones, like for example tapeworms. Now tapeworms are interesting because they've basically got their digestive systems on the outside because they live in a digestive system. So yeah, tapeworms, interesting animals and segmented but not in the normal sense of being segmented. Next one along. I mean, obviously, there isn't really a sequence. They're just all the same and they're just adapted to what they do. But they're often discussed in this order. Next one along is roundworms. I'm not going to be able to show you roundworms, but I can show you the soil that roundworms live in. It's been said that if the rest of the world disappeared apart from roundworms, we would see a ghostly outline because roundworms are basically the commonest animals in the world. However, they're not the most various animals in the world. Roundworms are almost always basic worms without segmentation, 
uh, with a through digestive system, unlike the flatworms, which just have a mouth which they also excrete through. And um, they have an absence of um, circular muscle, I think. And also they have cell constancy. Their bodies always have the same number of cells, with the result that they can't heal themselves. So roundworms, the next one along. And uh, you also find them in your poo for my big source of the next phylum, which is the annelids. Right, you see that lot there? Annelids. I'd like to turn the macro on, but I haven't really got time for that. So, yeah, annelids are segmented worms. And those are segmented worms. They're not doing very much at the moment. There's some tiger worms in there, actually. I don't know if you can see those, the stripy ones. There we are. That's in focus now, if I can hold it steady enough. They have segmentation, which is a very important thing. As far as animals are concerned, it gets things a long way. Uh, and they also have bristles that enable them to move around. As well as earthworms and tiger worms, other examples of worms include the polychaetes, which live in the sea mainly, and also leeches, uh, which are largely water living. I used to keep leeches as a pet. Actually, I used to keep um, flatworms as a pet as well. So there's just another worm up there, actually. So anyway, there you go. Now, as they become a little more sophisticated, and I don't want to be all uh, chain of beingy, but you also get arthropods which are the most ver they, they are the commonest in terms of the number of species now if you look there there's an insect on the side just where is it there insects crustaceans spiders scorpions crabs lobsters all of that lot are arthropods and arthropods are basically more sophisticated versions of worms. They're in the group known as the protostomes, um, which is a large group of phyla. And they are distinctive because they have hard external exoskeletons on their outside of their bodies. And they are also, they have jointed legs. And because they have jointed legs, they can get around quite easily. And there are hundreds of thousands of them. Insects are the most successful of any class in the animal kingdom, and the most successful in there are the beetles. There are at least 800,000 species of insect and a quarter of a million species of beetle. The other uh, major protostome phylum is the um, mollusks. Mollusks have a three-part body. They tend to have external skeletons like this one, this snail. Uh, they are unsegmented. And the three parts are the foot, which is the locomotory part, the head, which is the part with the eyes, and the mouth and the visceral hump which in this case is inside the shell they although they are unsegmented they're actually descended from segmented animals and they are protostomes fairly closely related to the worms that is the segmented worms next one along is one i can't really show you because the next one is the echinoderms <coughs> the echinoderms are they have five-fold symmetry, so they tend to be star-shaped, so it won't surprise you that an example of that, an example of an echinoderm, is a starfish. Now they have five-fold symmetry, a water vascular system, and also they tend to have, uh, they're osmotic conformers, so in other words, they, uh, their bodies always have the same concentration of salt inside them as outside them. And they're unique in having a water vascular system, which is a system of tubes that enables them to suck onto things and move things around inside their bodies, and it all moves through. Instead of having a front and a back, they have an oral surface at the bottom and an aboral surface at the top. Some of the ones that move around a lot tend to be bilaterally symmetrical. Now, the interesting thing about echinoderms is they're related to us. So that gives me the final phylum, which is us, the chordates. Now, chordates are really unusual, and I'm going to show you a chordate now, because I am one. So here I am. Obviously my body plan is atypical even for a chordate. Chordates include all the vertebrates. Nearly everything that exists is not a chordate. But we tend to empathise with them more, so we tend to see them more and notice them more. Chordates have a head end and a skull. They have muscle blocks, so they have actual muscles like that. A lot of them have internal skeletons, those are the vertebrates. Some chordates are not vertebrates. And they are also segmented. For example, you see with the ribs there, those are segments, and also the backbone is an example of segmentation. So they have muscle blocks. They also have a post-anal tail, which I can't show you because this species has a very short tail, which is only internal. 
and they are the only animals to have that. Actually, they're not the only animals to have that. Some other deuterostomes are. Now, the echinoderms and the cordex together are deuterostomes. That is, animals whose mouths develop after their anuses. And that groups them into a group which also includes a lot of other things like acorn worms and so forth. Now, just one more thing about the animal phyla is that I've only talked about the major phyla here. Most different phyla are actually very minor and only have a few species in them. The smallest phylum on the, in, among the major phyla is the echinoderms. Then there's a big gap, and then the largest of the minor phyla is the bryozoa, and those are moss-like animals. So, if you like this video, please rate, comment, subscribe, and share. If you dislike it, please tell me why, so I can improve, and I'll see you tomorrow.